going to do now is, um, I was going to do something on the publishing industry. Um, I'm going to just quickly just mention two things, and I don't want to go too long because we spent a lot of time already going on stuff. A lot of people here, I believe, first of all, everybody have a book in them, and so one of the reasons I was going to spend about 15, 20 minutes, but I cut it to five, if that much, um, is that, you know, I think everybody have a book to create, whether it's if they wanted to, whether it's an autobiography, a novel, a cookbook, a self-help book, or a poetry book. But you need to be aware of what publishing is about and to be careful. So you publish a book, but what exactly is the publishing process? You've written something, and now books are not the only thing you publish, but we'll talk specifically today about books. You need to secure the work, so what do you do? You copyright the work. You create, you, you assign an ISBN number, or your publisher assigns an ISBN number, which is International Standard Book Number. You can also put your Congress control number, a barcode, your book should be proofed and formatted, and then you publish your book. Can anyone copyright a book? I don't know how many people know here. You can't just go up on the copyright um, website and just say, you know, I'm Trish, I want to copyright a book. It usually has to come from some sort of publisher. So a lot of people became publishers to publish their work, and you're looking at somebody who's done that. And after I did that, my neighbor asked me one day if I would publish a book for her, and that's how I ended up publishing other people's work. But once somebody gives you an, an ISBN number, who owns that work? The person who owns the work is actually the person who owns the ISBN number. So you need to be careful when people on the internet are telling you to, um, to self-publish with them, and then you end up putting the ISBN number on your book and having to give them like 65% of your royalties. What I did was create my own publishing entity, help others to publish, and I don't have to pay anybody any royalties. I have to pay my taxes, I have to pay my expenses, but I do not have to uh, pay someone royalty. Um, later this year, I'm going to be doing two webinars on publishing. I want everybody to sign their name. There's a book going around. I don't know who have the book at this point, but please pass the book around so everybody can put at least their name and, and legibly enter your email, your email address because when I do the webinars, I would send out something out to everybody so we could get more into publishing in a more in-depth depth. I don't want to do it here. So just be careful. I think that's what I'll leave you with. Be careful if you're trying to publish out there know your rights, know what you're getting into, and publish your work responsibly. As the Garifuna, we have a, a, a group of thugs. They're called the Tugger Tugger Rhythm Kids that are gonna be performing, but I'm gonna ask my Garifuna drummers to do a little drumming while these guys get ready to come up and perform. So, ladies and gentlemen, some of the cultural stuff I will be describing in my book. I think I saw Maurice Avala here earlier, and I don't see him now. Where is he? Maurice? Here you are. He's another girlfriend and brother from Central America. Uh, so I'm going to ask my girlfriend and brother to give you a little taste of what life was like in St. Vincent, and what life is still like in Central America, what we in St. Vincent and the Grenadines have been missing. So, uh, gentlemen, give them a little bit of girlfriend and music.
Romero, and that's the Segunda, right? So this one, I'm understanding, it sounded like a heartbeat, and this one mimics the dancer. Okay, so if you step the dancer thing, like, I can't dance, I don't want you guys to laugh. I, I am so tempted, but I don't want to make a fool of myself. But, but we have a lot of folks who can dance with a punta, so let's get us a punta. They're getting the, 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 the music set up for the Tugga Tugga Rhythms kids. Uh, we're not going to miss a moment of the time that we have because it's very precious and I want everybody to have fun. So I, I'm going to talk, and you can stop me whenever you're ready with your, with your kids, about what motivated me to write this book. I don't have to say a lot because Selman Walters went into some of the history for me. To, to, uh, thank Charlie Johnson. Thank you so much, my friend. You did a good job explaining my life. Um, and, and what I, you know, how I came to write this book. But I think one of the main reasons that I wanted to write this book, particularly this book, this particular one, is I felt that there's a disconnect between Garifanas in the diaspora, those from Central America, those from Urume, St. Vincent, on both sides. I think, I think there's a disconnect in that we're not quite understanding of each other. And it's not, we love each other, but we're not quite understanding of each other. And I wanted to show what life was like in St. Vincent before all of the exile and all of the madness. I wanted to show our side of the story as well as their side of the story. I wanted to answer a major question. The major question, guys, that I want to answer is, how did St. Vincent Grenadines become so deculturized? How did we lose a culture, a language, not even know it exists, don't know a word of it? But for, but for people to understand that, we have our story too. As a people, we have our story. We didn't lose our culture and our language in a month, in a year, in 10 years. It took us 200 and something years for it to be beaten and threatened out of us. And I felt if I could write a book that would take life from 1775 and bring it up to the present, then we could really see what was life like. When the children were, when the people were exiled, what was life after on the mainland, and the, the homeland when they were exiled? Because after all, you would have had children gotten take, got taken away and their parents are left behind. Um, you would have had husbands got taken away, wife is left behind, friends, uh, people in your community. And I wanted to depict that, I wanted to show this. So I picked a village in St. Vincent de Grenadines uh, called Masarica. And for you, those of you from St. Vincent, that is modern day Greg's. Everybody know where Greg's is in St. Vincent? Okay, so Masarica, when you read this book, it's really Greg's. And that is what it was called then. It was named Greggs later by a Frenchman, Mr. Greggs, but the, the, the girl from the name was Masarika. So I picked a village in Yurume, and I decided to uh, name the, to create this life in this village, show the tension that was building, show the life of the people, 
you know, you would have, you know, Village Square where there would be great entertainment and comedic routines and people had a life and they looked out for each other and they trusted and they loved each other. And then came the Europeans. And the girlfriend, unfortunately, our people happened to be sitting on the most fertile piece of, piece of the land in St. Vincent. We happen to, in St. Vincent, we have intention. The joke is, if you throw a broomstick in St. Vincent, uh, let me put it this way. If you throw a broomstick at Vinci, you're going to catch root. That's how spot the land in St. Vincent, and particularly in the windward side of the island where the girlfriend predominated after a while. Because the leeward side, had the, the Europeans had been invited, well, uh, welcomed by the original Caribs, and they had been walking pockets and pieces of that land over years, and it was depleted in, in, um, in the leeward side. So the, the soil was fertile, but it was not as good as even up to today, the rich soil of the windward side. In, at, at a certain point, the French instigated a split between the yellow and black Caribs. Now these are names you can give to them. I prefer to say Garifuna and Kalanago. Kalanago being the original indigenous Carib and Garifuna being what they call the black Caribs. And so during that instigation, the black Caribs went to the windward sides, side of the island, and the yellow Caribs remained on the leeward side with the pockets of the European. But it is believed that the black Caribs always knew, or the Garifuna, or something you would hear me say, Garinagu, or Tani Johnson, they were struggling with that one. Garinagu means Garifuna people. Garifuna is singular, Garinagu is Garifuna people. So, after, it is believed that the Garifuna people knew that that was the better part of the island. It was also a part of the island that allowed them to welcome slaves running away from Barbados that come down to St. Vincent on the trade wind, by the trade winds. So it was the best part of the island to go to. And so, um, they didn't like that, because we need this for sugar cane. And if you go to St. Vincent, what you will notice is that we do not have a lot of flat land. We're very hilly, very mountainous, and hence the reason why the windward side, which had more flat land, was very much coveted for sugar cane, cotton, indigo, and the likes. And in Tears of Exile, I, I know when you look at the cover, you're going to wonder, why did she put the cover like this? And the cover is our paramount chief, Joseph Chatelier, who today is the national hero of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the only national hero of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. On the bottom, there are two British soldiers with their muskets. They are the Garifuna people being chained and taken to the, to the, to the, um, to the ships. And you see what looks like rain coming down from the eyes of the gentleman, Joseph Chatelier. Um, Joseph Chatelier, I have always wondered how sad he must have been when he was seeing his people who he had fought hard to protect being driven out of Yume in chains of free people who were not slaves, the girl for the people were the few, but the only free black people in the Caribbean. And I often used to wonder, his spirit must have been crying. I don't know about you guys, if you believe it's in life after death, I believe there's something that goes on with the spirit after death. And I always thought of him as looking down and weeping when the, his, his people were being driven from St. Vincent. So what looks like rain is actually the tears of Joseph Chatelier coming down onto his people, weeping because he couldn't protect them. And they were being, the thing that he was fighting hardest to have not happen, it was happening. They were being driven out of Yurume. And our people in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, they put up a really big fight to stand up for dignity, for their country, and to pay the price. And our brothers and sisters from Central America, I don't want to cry again, I'm a crying fool at times, but I want to thank you guys. I want everybody who's here from Central America, Gary from the people, I want you to stand. Because without you, we would not have a culture and a heritage <laughs> in between. We would not have a culture and a heritage in between. 
you fought, you were driven away. And if there's anything good that came out of that exile is that you were able to maintain that culture undisturbed in Central America so that today I could have Hugo Kira and take you back there with me and try to retrieve the culture. So thank you so much. I mentioned before that there were many happy times and so I'm going to start doing some excerpts. I'm trying to go through, go, I'm not following the program exactly because I want while they're getting ready. I want to spend the time doing this so that I don't have to do it later on. All right, that part I think I'll leave for the adults. I don't think I want to read that with children. Yeah. As she had done most Saturdays before, we're talking now about Masarika, the village in Yurume. Tantan Bella traded and sold her cassava bread, cassava farine, our root starch, Madame Go Dumpling, sweet potato, dukuna, and coconut tart, coconut fudge, and coconut cakes on weekends. These snacks were popular cassava, our root potato, and coconut delicacies, and they were in high demand. The children would always often use coins to purchase snacks on Saturday. Even the most of the exchange of goods and services was done through trading. The Gorinagu were known to take advantage of the French lovers' tobacco and use it as a currency to purchase, truck, to purchase items from them, including ammunition, to fight the British. They would also sell items to the French for coins. The coins the kids used around the square were French coins. Her assortment of colorful baskets lined the grass in the village square, as they once lined the market in Kingstown. Since the escalation of tensions with the British, Chief Galleon had discouraged Tampton from selling her basket to the Kingstown market. He was able to find market for her baskets in nearby villages. She was always sure to sell Sarah Bear to give that special finish to the assortment of goods. The men had constructed a touch shed on the northern side of the village square with a bench and a table for Tamtam to peddle her homemade goods. She would often help Muriel and Jacinta process their cassava bread and farine so she could get a basket of farine and cassava bread to retail in the village square. Get your hat, Dukuna, Madame Go Dumpling, cassava bread, your, get your farine. No need to make it when I can bake it and sell it fresh from Tamtam basket, she would yell. Get your coconut fudge, sugar cake, and coconut tart. Don't forget to wash them down with a refreshing cup of sorrel for fun. And you don't have to worry how you can get it home because you can buy one at and beautiful baskets. Another excerpt. Muriel filled several calabash of food to take home for our fans in the kids. He was such a beautiful husband and father, she thought. Even though Francesca did not have much of an appetite, all she had to do was add an extra portion to her father's plate, and Fran was sure to sit next to her papa and eat off his plate. This strategy was always certain to work with a young girl. Born two months early, Tam Tam Bella had delivered the baby girl and shown Muriel how to keep her wrapped in warm cloth only removing the cloth a piece at a time to clean the infant with the warm coconut oil. Tantan had given Muriel one of her large baskets to use as a cradle for the tiny baby. Those are some happy times. And just to give you an idea of what life was like in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, before the girl from the people were taken out of St. Vincent. But then concerns, concerns started to pop its head up. And here's a conversation between two friends at the village square. You're right, you see inside. I know what you're saying is true, but I can't be as strong as you, Clarice. When is it going to stop? Every time we get an ounce of peace, they circle us like sharks, circling bloody meat, 
sometimes I feel like we could just give up and give up the fight. It's just not give up the fight. Are you kidding me, Lucine? I agree with Chief Chatelier. We are sons and daughters of African kings and warriors, mingled with the blood of the proud free Caribbean Arawak people. We don't give up. We fight until the settling of the dust. We fight until the blood flow out of our veins. We fight to defend what's ours because we have no choice. We don't start the fight. We defend ourselves against those who fight us. I'm just getting sick, Clorite. I'm just getting sick of it. Lucine picked at her nails. Every time we think these people are leaving us alone, they find somewhere to undermine us. When is it going to stop? I don't know, Lucine. I don't know. But this is why our men cannot stop fighting. So they can stop the evil part of the British. I am so tired. I just want to put an end to this. It moved from an area of concern to sad times. In the days that follow, the British propaganda mill generated rumors of a duel between Major Lee and Joseph Chatier, chief of the Black Caribs or Garifuna. According to the account, chief was killed with Major Lee proven to be the better swordsman. The death of the paramount chief was a shock to the Garinabu and a blanket of somberness covered Masarika and other Garifuna villages in the days following his death. Chief, Deputy Chief Duvalier, along with his fighters, escaped into the interior to regroup and strategize. British soldiers were emboldened with the death of Joseph Chatelier. They were openly destroying the Garifuna property and lives. For the first time ever, Masarika ceased from normal activities. The village square was barren on Saturdays. Children were huddling in their huts more than playing in their yards. Father Gustav felt it best to see school for a while. The British soldiers were seen interrogating villagers on a regular basis. Their main goal was to find out the names of all the people who were working with the defenders. The village seemed to be a, a ghost of its former vibrant self. After surprise attacks by the Guardians, a Garifuna fraction, against soldiers entering Masarika, the British would send their soldiers into the village under the cover of darkness to burn huts and provision grounds. The Garinagu piled into the HMS experiment and the other vessels for the trip to Rotan, which today is a part of Honduras. The, the voyage was an odious one. The people who were deemed gravely ill and too sick to travel were left behind on Baliso, the barren island where they had put them to die for eight months. The island no doubt became their final resting place. The soldiers were brutal. Often reminding the Garinago that not even an iguana would survive on their new home, Rotan, which at that point was under British control. Even the sick and the wounded were shown no mercy. They were lifted onto the ship and tossed like cargo onto the deck. The stench of the bloody bandages was told the tale of neglected wounds was astonishing. The moaning and wailing of the sick and injured were deafening. The soldiers turned a deaf ear to the suffering of the people. His mother and sister followed slowly behind him as he sat comforting his mother. His father tugged at his arm. You okay, Papa? He asked. I need to talk to you, Manny. He whispered. Shh. Save your strength, Papa. No, son. I need to talk to you. I'm not. <clears throat> I'm not going to make it. I want you to look after Mama and friend for me. He 
managed with labored breaths, and tears streaking down his face. I knew you would look after them. His glassy eyes stared at Manuel intently. The following morning, the soldiers came around to discard of the dead bodies. Manuel asked that he could come with them to bury his father's remains. As he raced to follow them, one soldier pushed him away with the butt of his musket and stared menacingly at him. He motioned to two other men who pulled Alphonse's body to the dirt towards the top of the hill. His body was no doubt tossed into one of the daily mass graves used to dispose of the dead body. He embraced his mother and sister as they sobbed uncontrollably. Mary Louise walked over to them and placed her hand on Muriel's shoulder. He's with the ancestors, she whispered. He has found peace. I'm glad it's over. He's not suffering anymore. Some people wish they could find the peace he now has. They pulled his body through the dirt like an animal, but they can't hurt him anymore. His soul is already with the Ahari, the, 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 the Ahari I think means the spirit of the ancestors. He feels nothing, said Muriel with confidence. I'm glad it's over. He's not suffering anymore. Some people wish they could find a peace. That's right, my sister. They can't hurt him anymore. He's strong and hold on. Your children need you now more than ever. You need each other. Don't give up. She begged. I know that sounds like just a horrific fiction. It's historic fiction in the sense that the characters were not anybody that I would really know. But you can bet that there were many Manuels and Lemery who were the two main characters in that part of the story. And I wanted to be that voice that would have some ideas about what happened in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I see that my little tugs are ready to do their tugger, tugger rhythms. So I'm going to turn this over to them as they make their way up to the, to the front of the room. Give them a round of applause. They've been working hard on this practice. Hold on, hold on, give me a second. Yeah. One second. A line up. Ten hook? Yeah. First of all, I would like to thank everyone who came out today to support my aunt, Trish Hill, and her new book, Tears of Exile. This is the third one. The first one, I heard the review on it. it was, I didn't even actually buy it myself. The first, I did buy it. I didn't get to read it at first, but then when I started hearing the feedback, I said, you know what? Let me, let me start on this, and, and let, me, let me say it. If you had it, you know what it is. Now, tonight, I have the kids with me, and um, she asked me to have them perform with me as I do this new dance that I came up with. It's a dance hall rhythm. Now, I do hip hop, but being from the Caribbean, being from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, I have a lot of obvious soca and calypso influence. Um, growing up in New York, obviously you get the hip hop influence. So after going down to St. Vincent in 2009, after not going for probably like 10 years, 11 years since my grandfather's passing, I kind of fell back in love with the music that my father would play those Sunday mornings loud, waking us up and all of that. And um, I had a hunch, I said, you know what? I'm a very versatile art artist, artiste, as we would say. And um, why not try blending some of the soca with the hip hop? I did a rhythm when I came back to New York. The feedback was pretty decent. So I said, you know what? 
Based off of that, let me try something now. Let me do something original. So I had my partner put together uh, a rhythm. It was called Tucker Tucker Rhythm, because he has these craziest names for them. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna keep that name. I made the song not really intended it to be a dance, but when I thought about the words, it's like follow the instruction kind of thing. I said, you know what, let me figure out something to this. And um, originally, I didn't think kids in mind when I did it, but when I performed it at my cousin Rashida's birthday barbecue then the summer of September, my aunt and everybody was like, you know what, I like that, it's catchy. So now as she's doing this event, she's telling me, you know what, why don't you get the kids involved and uh, get them to do the rhythm? So I said, you know what, the original one wasn't quite kid friendly. So I had to make an adjustment to it and adjust the words a little bit. So, without any further ado, I'm gonna show y'all how to do the tugger, tugger rhythm. It's, I see a couple of kids in the audience. Feel free to stand up and it's, it's very easy to catch on to. You know, even adults too, <laughs> don't be shy. And um, with that said, with no further ado, let's do it. Let's go. Yeah. You ready? Bring it back. Now, get on the floor. Now come so back up high. Go down low. And I show time. Yeah, you don't know. Take your time. Get it shine like the sun. Yeah, I'm looking your body. Have a good time. Yeah, I'm falling in love with your wine. And I must have a piece of your time. And you look so sweet. I don't like you. Do your body. Have a good time. How you get your swag so fly? When you get those, you know that I got. How you get those pants on? Oh my. Try to get that dance. You don't mind. No brother. Try to get that chance. Slow wine, slow wine, I mean, well, see you give me some of the poor wine. You keep it up, and you know we go loud, because it doesn't take much for me to know I'm going to slide. Oh my, oh my, oh you're gorgeous, I'm getting lost in your eyes. Yeah, you, your body, have a good time. Yeah, I'm in love with your wine, you're a must, I'm a piece of your time. And you look so sweet, I don't like you. Yeah, you, your body, you, your body, the way you move your feet, you look so happy. With your super looks in your body, you got these who's all looking like Johnny. Hey, mommy, give me Johnny. Take you out the day when you're on street. But that's my me, but the who's the weekend. Look at you move, girl, you look like that. Woo! Yeah, I'm up so, not up so. Find up high, go down low. Not show time, yeah, here I go. Take your time, yeah, you shine like the sun. Get up, look at your body, have a good time. Yeah, fall in love with your wife. Yeah, I must have a piece of your time. Girl, yeah, you look so sweet, I don't like that. Yeah, I'm up so. Up high, go down low, now show time, you don't know. Take your time, girl, you shine like the sun glow. And when you wind at the time, that you must go. Then I sleep on the team, cause you don't know. Everywhere you go, man, I call around you. Man, I spend money, man, I follow around you. Nobody wants to step for you. But then you come see what's left, I just come. And I feel like you were set for me, my man. Right now, you really, really step to me. Now, do your body have a good time. Me, I find a love with your wife, and I must have a piece of your time. Cause you look so sweet, I don't know how you look. Everybody has a good look, let me wipe on it. Look, look, good now. Walk, 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 walk. Now I'm flexing out the mask. I want first thing about the house. Next, don't be on the top deck, but there's no other. You're telling them about it. You're gonna be the one saying, now move up so. Now come so. Back up high, go down low. Now show time, yeah, you don't know. Take your time, get your shine like this. Your body have a good time. Your body love your with your wife in a bus. Have a piece of your time. Now you look so sweet, I don't like that joke. Yeah, joke. Yeah, joke. Yeah, joke. Yeah, joke. And I feel like, yeah, joke, 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 joke. Why not everybody that's a good look? Yeah, joke, 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 joke. Why not everybody that's a good look? Yeah, joke. 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 Yeah, Tugger Tugger Rhythm. Good job, kids. Job, good job. Congrats, you may stay coming. Here's the next side. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Tugs. Have you ever seen a more untied little people? <laughs> 
Oh, you guys did a good job. You know, they were, they were practicing. They were practicing, and I had several occasions to be able to see them. And I said, no, I don't want to see them do it. I want to be surprised. So you did a good job, Ajafa. You know, it's, it's a much more spicy type of dance, but even though he's not a dad yet, he said to me, Auntie, I am not, I have to make it kid friendly. I don't want them whining. And, you know, first of all, you Americans think that you are the, who coined this, what they call it now, talking? is the same thing we call whining. It's the same thing we call whining. So this song has some whining, but he did not want the children to do that. He wanted to make it um, kid friendly. So that, that's a wonderful part.